slaughtered in. Oh, sorry. That's right. Provided sorry. that it, it comes from being slaughtered in in the proper way. Now, so the 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 the, the bare bones of this is that uh, the Almighty says to us that we're we're not allowed to slaughter meat for our own purposes within the temple precincts. But once we are outside the temple, we're allowed to do that wherever we wish. And this, of course, is what we do nowadays to uh, have meat. The uh, two interesting words that I want to focus on is where it says here, you can slaughter meat, um, Moshe says to, to the Jewish people, as I commanded you. So Moshe says to the Jewish people, just um, do your slaughtering as in the proper way, like I told you, and everything will be fine. And you can hunt through the Torah, you'll not find when Moshe says to the Jewish people, this is how you slaughter meat. And we know, of course, we have rules. It has to be a, a straight blade, uh, it has to be cutting across the majority of the windpipe and the food pipe uh, uh, in the animal, uh, the, the, the trachea and the esophagus. And uh, that way the animal is kosher. And then we've got rules about salting meat as well to, to take the blood out because the blood is not kosher. So what we have here is one of several hints of the to the presence of an oral law alongside the written law. And this is what I wanted to look through today. Just what is the oral law? How can we be sure that it's there? Why is it there? And what do we do with it? So, um, we've seen one little hint to it there. There are other hints to the oral law in the written law itself. So, for example, it says in the Torah, bind the words of Torah as a sign on your hand, and they should be total face, whatever that is, uh, between your eyes. And that's the mitzvah of tefillin. But if you just look at it like that, it's very hard to understand what it's saying. What, what words? How do I tie them? Do I just make it up? It, it, what if I'm doing it wrong? How do I know if I'm doing it wrong or not? And so on. Uh, and, and if you think, well, maybe it doesn't really matter, here's another instance of a rule which is so terse as to, the, as, as to verge on incomprehensibility, and yet it's important that we know it. So it says also in the Torah, you know, that the six days you will do malacha, but the seventh day is a holy Sabbath for you. So we can't do malacha on Shabbos, we can do malacha in the rest of the week. What happens if I do malacha? Anybody who does malacha on the seventh day will be put to death. Oh my goodness, so I really need to know what exactly this malacha thing is. But you're not telling me. There's no one in the Torah that says what is malacha. And don't think it means hard work, because in the narrative of the Jewish people in Egypt and their slavery there, the only word that is not used is malacha. It talks about avoida. It talks about avoida's perech. It does not talk about malacha. So it doesn't mean hard work. It's something else. And yet the Torah doesn't bother telling me what malacha is. Obviously, it's relying on an oral law, a tradition, an understanding from that time, which tells you what malacha is. And as we know, we have 39 categories of malacha that are defined for us. And there are other hints as well. Um, you'll notice, of course, that the written Torah has no vowels. And that's how it was given to us. And this means that unless you know how the words should be read, there are ambiguities there which can make critical differences. The most famous one is when it says, uh, do not see the kid in its mother's milk. It's its milk, chalev, the milk of, bachalev, in the milk of imoy, its mother. Now, when you haven't got vowels in a Sefer Torah, if you don't know how to read it, you could just as well read it, bachalev imoy, in the fat of its mother. So what am I not allowed to do? Is it chalev? Is it chalev? Tell me. And, and if you look at the written text of the Torah without the vowels, it doesn't tell you. In fact, furthermore, there's a, there's a, a, a cute story in the Gemara about somebody who went to, I think it was Rava, and said to him, I want you to teach me just the written law. Uh, I, 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 I don't know anything. I want the written law. I'm not interested in what the rabbi's got to say. Just the written law. Let's go to the basic. So Rava says, fine. So he says, well, first of all, we need to learn how to read. So the guy says, all right, teach you how to read. So he writes an Aleph base game with Dalad, and he says, you know, this is an Aleph, this is a base, this is a Gil, this is a Dalad. Go away and learn them, and tomorrow we'll carry on. So the guy comes back the next day, and he says, right, I know, I know my first four letters. This is an Aleph, this is a base, this is a Gil, this is a Dalad. So Rav says, no, 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 you got it wrong. It, it, it says Dalad, Gil, based Aleph. What do you mean, Aleph, base Gil, Dalad? You got it wrong. But, and, and the man says to him, yeah, but you told me it's Aleph, base Gil, Dalad. So Rav says to him, you see, even for reading it, you need to rely on a tradition. You need to rely on, on, on a rabbi to tell you what to do. So, so, you know, the, don't think that the written law is, is, is stands alone. You can't even read it 
without a tradition about how it should be read and understood. And there are other things like this. So and there's another one as well, another indication of the, the primacy that the Torah puts, uh, Torah sets by uh, people consulting with, with, with teachers. It, it's a psukim in Shoftim where it says, if you can't understand some things, next week, etc., go up to the place that God will choose, that's the temple, go to the judges who will be in charge at that time, ask them, and they will tell you what to do. Do whatever they teach you. Do not turn from what they say to the right or to the left. So there again, we see that the Torah expects us to turn to the authorities of our time to guide us in how to, to know what is right and wrong. So clearly, we're not just supposed to look at the book and work it out for ourselves. We're supposed to go to our teachers. Now, that's all well and good. We can understand that the oral law is there, but why should it be there? And how exactly do the oral law and written law connect up? Why not just have a written law that explains everything? Um, God can do anything, he could do that as well. Why not have an oral law just by itself? So the answer is that the, 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 the written law, first of all, to deal with the connection between, I'm going to read out a long passage from Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, and I'm going to read it in its entirety because it so beautifully explains it. So this is what he says. The written Torah is to be to the oral Torah in the relationship of short notes on a full and extensive lecture on any scientific subject. For the student who has heard the whole lecture, short notes are quite sufficient to bring back afresh to mind at any time the whole subject of the lecture. For the student, a word, a mark of interrogation or exclamation, a dot, the underlining of a word, etc., etc., is often quite sufficient to recall to mind a whole series of thoughts. For those who had not heard the lecture from the teacher, such notes would be completely useless. If they were to reconstruct the scientific content of the lecture literally from such notes, they would of necessity make many errors. Words, marks, etc., serve those scholars who had heard the lecture as instructed guiding stars to the wisdom that had been taught and learned. And this is the connection between the oral law and the written law. The written law is like lecture notes. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, there's, there's, there's an old snooty joke um, about the difference between uh, any old college and the university. In any old college, um, when the, so in, in, in university, when the lecturer says, good morning, everybody, he's completely ignored. And in, in, a, in an any old college, when he says, good morning, everybody writes down, good morning. Now, the, 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 the thing is that in the, the term is like a university lecture. It's very, very brief. And there are little turns of phrase there, little apparent anomalies or emphases or uh, ellipses or um, disquisitions at length, all of which point to details that are beyond the text. If you know the oral law, you know what they mean. If you don't know the oral law, it doesn't make any sense. So the written law without oral law is very difficult. In fact, you'll see in Christian translations of, of, the, of the Torah, they often rely on the Septuagint, which is the, the rabbi's um, uh, paraphrasing of the Torah. And they will often gloss over certain things or change certain things so that it, it makes a literal sense. And the Christians say, you know, the, 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 the five books of Moses, we have them aren't really right. There's mistakes in them. We know that they're not mistakes because we know the oral law that these apparent mistakes refer to. So, for example, in Devarim, it says that Pesach uh, lasts for six days. In Shemais, it says it lasts for seven days. Why so? Because there are certain rules that apply just for the first day and certain rules that apply for the other six. The obligation to eat matzah is only at the beginning. The, the permission to eat matzah is through the rest of the time. That's why I have the six and the seven. But if you don't know that, it doesn't make any sense. And so on and so on throughout the Torah. The, 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 the text of the written law is there like lecture notes for the oral law, which is the, which is the, the, the real meat of it all. And that oral law has been saved for us in the Mishnah and the Gemara, thank goodness. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi realized that the oral law was being forgotten. It had been painstakingly handed down by word of mouth from teacher to pupil over hundreds of years. But he saw that because of the, 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 the weakness of his time and the persecutions that the Romans were inflicting on the Jews, that it was proving increasingly difficult for people to hold on to the oral law. So he summarized it <clears throat> after interviewing all the scholars of his generation into some easily remembered um, blocks of information, which was the Mishnah. Thereafter, 
there were discussions about the Mishnah over the next 300 years or so, which were again summarized by Ravina and Rav Ashi into the Gemara. And so you see that over these 300 years or so, the whole Talmud was fashioned. The Talmud is what we refer to as the Mishnah Gemara together. And it's, as, as anybody you know who's ever studied it, it's very, very deep. You can grapple with it for days just to understand one line of it. it it's very, very clever. And why do we have an oral law? What, what's the point of it? Why not have it all written out? And the answer to this is that um, you can, if you have something written down and you rely on the written text of it, it's open to assault. It can be, it can be misconstrued. It can be challenged. It can be twisted and betrayed. So we need to rely on a person-to-person -person handover so that the original meaning of it is properly conveyed. Uh, uh, take anything you like. And in a, you, can, you can argue it to death if you put your mind to it, if it's just written out. There's a famous Jewish joke about uh, 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 somebody who opens up a fishmonger's in town and he puts a big sign over the fish shop saying, fresh fish sold here. So somebody comes along and says, of course it's fresh. You won't be, you won't be selling rotten fish, would you? So he, he paints out the word fresh. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, fresh fish sold here. Of course it's sold here. We can smell that it's a fish shop. And you won't put fresh fish sold somewhere else. So he... He, he rubs out the word here. And I just says, fish sold. And somebody else says to him, well, of course he's saying, you're not giving it away. So he rubs out the word sold. And then he's just got the word fish there. And somebody says, well, of course it's fish. You know, we can see the fish in the wind. You don't do that either. So he really rubs out the entire sign and chops it off and uses it for firewood. This is the assault that can be um, uh, 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 put on the written word per se. And we need to have an oral to back it up so that the proper meaning of it and the spirit of it are properly maintained and handed over from one generation to that person to person. And we are all the custodians of that knowledge to this day. God relies on us to hand it over properly and make sure that it is properly handed on. The Maharal says the most beautiful thing. He says that the oral law is holier than the written law. The proof being that the written law is written down. The oral law is too holy to be written in the Sefer Torah. Part of the holiness of the oral law is the parchment on which it is written. The written law is written on parchment. What's the parchment for the oral law? And the answer is it's us. The oral law is written on the human soul, on a Jewish soul, and handed on, copied from one soul to the next. It's such a beautiful thing that we are the Sifre Torah of the oral law, and we hand it on very proudly from one generation to the next. What about, you may say, if you're not happy with the notion of the oral law being rooted in the written law, maybe it was reverse engineered into it. How do we know that the oral law dates back to the time of Moshe? So here too we have answers, because there are aspects of the oral law which date back to Mosaic time specifically. So for example, the oral law talks about the efficacy of the cities of refuge. And it, it deals with <clears throat> a question uh, we had a couple of weeks ago in the parasha, which is that Moshe set up three cities of refuge on the east bank of the River Jordan, and the other three cities of refuge were set up on the west bank. And these cities of refuge were, were a cause for somebody who, God forbid, kills somebody else by accident, and uh, they, they go to the city of refuge and they are safe there. So the, the Talmud talks about whether the three cities of refuge that Moshe set up were going to be uh, effective to protect somebody who, God forbid, fills by mistake, kills by mistake, before the cities of refuge in Israel proper were active. And the command says they went. They were not active until the cities of refuge were set up in the land of Israel proper. So the command says, in that case, why did he bother setting up these cities of refuge on the east bank of the River Jordan if they weren't even going to be effective at all? And the command answers, because Moshe thought, here's a bit of a mitzvah that I can do, a mitzvah so precious, even I can just do a bit of it, I'll do a bit of it. So the question we can ask is, why, if the, if the oral law was reverse engineered into the written law centuries later, why would it bother talking about something that was only relevant at the time of Moshe and not in its own time? And the answer is, it doesn't date from centuries after the Torah is given. It dates back to Moshe's time. And that's why it concerns itself even with the rules that were only re relevant in the time of Moshe. Another rule that applies is, um, we know that if somebody found Soras, uh, translated as leprosy, on the walls of their home, the home would have to be destroyed. So the Gemara deals with what about if somebody finds Saras in their home in the first 14 years of the Jewish presence in the land of Israel? 
which is the, the seven years of conquest and seven years of division of the land. What if somebody found Taras in the home in that time? Would it class as Taras or not? And the answer is no, it wouldn't. Again, why would we be concerning ourselves with something which isn't relevant, only relevant for those 14 years? And the answer is, all of was around at that time. And therefore, it concerned itself with things that were practical for that time. And, and it, 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 that's an, yet another instance of evidence of the contemporaneity, the, the contemporaneous nature of the oral and written laws. Now, there's something else, which, and I'm going to finish with this, a, 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 a cute little thing which is that we can document the transmission of the oral law, not from parent to child, but from teacher to pupil. And Pirke always starts us off with this. As we know, Moshe Kiba Torah from Sinai, Moshe accepted the Torah from Sinai, Moshe Ali Yeshua handed it over to Yeshua, Yeshua is a came, Yeshua handed it over to the elders, the came to Nevim, the elders handed it over to Nevim, the Nevim is the and the elders, sorry, the prophets handed it over to the men of the great assembly. All that's very lovely. What about since then? What chain of tradition do we have from then to now? So if you bear with me a second, I'll show you. Here we are. I'll just make this a bit larger. There now. So if I have a look here, you got Moshe, Yeshua, Pinchas, Eli, Shmuel, David, Achia, Eliyahu, Elisha, Yehoyada, Zechariah, Hosea, Amos, Yeshaya, Micha, Yel, Nochum, Chavach, Tzfania, Yemria, Baruch, Ezra. Then we have the elders of the Great Assembly, Shimonat Sanik, Antigonus, Yisaychai. Then we have the pairs at the beginning of Pirkei Avais, the Zugais. Here we go. I'll not read them all out. You can see for yourselves. Then we have the Tanoim, which is the people who were um, quoted in the Mishnah, compared by Rabbi Huda Anossi. You'll recognize a lot of these names. Then we've got the Amorim, people who were around in the time of the Gemara, um, and their opinions were compiled by Ravin and Ravashi in about the year 500. Then you've got the Rabboni Savaroi, um, who were around towards the end of the Tamari period and beyond. Then you've got the Ga'inim, um, and here you've got people like Rav Sadigon, Rav Haigon. You'll see them coming in a second. Here we are. I'll move us on a little bit quicker. These are the Ga'inim. Rav Shariru Ga'in, there we are. Rav Hai Ga'in. Then you've got the Rishonim, who were around um, in the early medieval time. Um, you've got Rashi there. You've got Rashbam. You've got Rav Metz, people from Tosfos, uh, and so on. Then you've got the Acharonim, who are more in our own time. Um, people like the Ramah, Rav Katz, um, Rabbi Rav Chosid, uh, Rabbi Rav Kramer, which is the Vilna Ga'in, Rav Chaim Vodaj, and his pupil, and so on. Rav Yosef Tov Salavechi, the Bishra Levi, Rav Chaim Salavechi, the Bishra Rav. Now we come to our own time, Rav Sam Zalman Oyebach, Rav Zalman Nechemya Goldberg, who was the son of Rav Sam Zalman. Then you got me. And then you got Edward United. So you see that we can actually trace the handover of Torah from one generation to the other, right all the way along from Moshe to us personally. And it's been handed over diligently and painstakingly from that time to this. And, and you could do this yourself. You don't need to have, you know, that's just the one that, that applies to me. But, you know, if you just look around online a little bit to your Torah teachers and their teachers and so on, it's easy to compile this list for yourself. I, I did it because I'm a lister. I, I like lists. And there we are with this train of tradition going from that time to this. And this is the very heart of Torah. It, it's, it's written on our souls. It is the living explanation of Torah, which we rely upon to make sure that it is kept whole and intact and, 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 and in, in spirit and in word from that day to this. And that's what I wanted to say. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Rabbi Lister. I will uh, just unmute everyone. Um, uh, so you can um, all unmute yourselves if you want to, if everyone's able to unmute. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? That was very interesting. Um, uh, anyone mm. have any questions or any comments they want to pass on um, about this morning? Any? Yes, yes. Hello, good. Hello, good. Hello, good. Rabbi. Good nice to see you again. Um, am I right in assuming that Nevi'im and Ketubim is the totality of the oral law? 
we have Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Right. That, that's that's a. It's a difficult question to answer, but I'll do my best. The, the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, Rav Hirsch says, are a kind of commentary on the Torah, on the Chumash, the five books of Moses. When there were messages that needed to be reinforced and amplified for the Jews who came immediately after the time of, of Moshe, those messages were written, some of those messages that would be enduring for all time were written down in the Nevi'im and Aksubim. But that's just selected messages that needed special emphasis and special clarification. Most of the oral law was around at the time of Moshe and has been handed down orally uh, from that time to this. And Tehillim, what about Tehillim? Is that, is that part of uh, law or oral law? It's the written law. So the, the, the Nevi'im and Ksuvim are part of the written, well, they are written. I wouldn't say the written law, um, uh, certainly not in the same status as Chumash. So much so that when, when if you bring a, a, a proof for something in the Gemara from Nevi'im and Ksuvim, you'll be challenged to say, why didn't you bring it from the Chumash, the five books uh, of Moshe, which you should do if you can, because that's the primary source of law. The Vim and Suvim are subsidiary to it. They just, um, they are explanations, commentaries, amplifications of it. And everything you find in the Vim and Suvim, you can find in the Chumash as well. Thank you. Sometimes I have to look pretty hard, but it's very important to bear that distinction in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you again, Rabbi Lister, um, for joining us and always being supportive of this uh, this venture over the last um, year and a half of uh, our Zoom our Zoom breakfast. Uh, I can say thank you, Stephen. Thank you for your support. <laughs> and uh, just to say that uh, next week we'll have another Zoom uh, a Zoom meeting um, with um, our advisor. The speaker is uh, during the course of the week, and then the following week on the twenty fourth of. Um, uh, so, no, two, so next two weeks we'll be having uh, on Zoom, and then three mm. weeks time we'll be um, having a, an actual breakfast uh, for the last two weeks of this month, 24th and 31st. We're actually meeting in Shaw with a proper breakfast, but we'll still have it over Zoom for those who, who can't be in Edgeware in person. And then we'll have a short break over the uh, over the Omen Orion because they fall on Tuesdays, so it's a bit awkward to have a Zoom uh, when we should be in shul um, for Rosh Hashanah, and then we'll start again after Sukkot. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good week, everyone. Thank we'll you for coming. Thanks, Rabbi Lister, well. again. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.